Hey, how's everybody doing? Woo! What? That's loud. Always you guys good to be right? loud, right? End of the day, end of the day. Yay! Woo! All right. So, how many have been here for more than one of these IFT next todays? Okay, a bunch of you. Great. Okay. So, uh, we are really excited uh, to be here. Uh, I'm Dave Lundahl. I'm the CEO for Insights Now. I'm Greg Stuckey. I'm the Chief Research Officer at Insights Now. Right. So we're here to talk about a really exciting topic, and that's clean label. How many of you in your jobs working for manufacturers find that clean label is important? Yeah. How many of you work for ingredient companies? Is important to you, right? Any retailers here? Good, there's some. How many colonologists? Yeah, yeah, yeah right there. Great. Uh, so if you're working for a retailer, you're working for a, 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 a large brand um, or a small brand um, as a manufacturer, if you're working for the ingredient industry, you know that clean label is a really important topic for you. So we're here to talk about uh, basically three years of research and insights that we've been working on at Insights Now for, uh, that has involved more than 20,000 primary U.S. shoppers and a community of several hundred clean label enthusiasts that we are now working with and engaging with every day. So we're going to present some great results, great insights. Uh, we're excited to share that with you. But what is also really interesting about this whole thing is that we're finding as we sort of learn more about this, underlying everything is all about trust. Okay, so that's really the key theme. So what we're gonna do is uh, present uh, sort of a back and forth. There'll be a interactive exchange, uh, asking you some questions. Greg's gonna ask me some questions. I'm gonna ask him some questions as we go through this. In the end, we're gonna come up with six sort of recommendations that you could take away, no matter if what your role is in the food industry. And, uh, and then also we're going to look at beyond uh, this moment and invite those of you who wish to join us in what we're calling the Craves Conversation. And it'll be something you can sign up with your smartphones by doing a simple text. Okay, so that'll be at the end, but uh, let's get started. So given all of this, I like to start with a simple question. What does clean label have to do with consumer trust? Any sort of thoughts here? And we've got... Um, uh, Anybody want to raise their hand? Gentlemen here. Yep. Bring the microphone over to him. No? No ideas. We're kind of no. warming up. Oh, right here. Good. Thank you. So um, basically, consumers want to know what's in what they're eating, right? So clean label means, okay, I can understand all of the words that are on the back of the pack. So I know this contains, you know, sugar and salt and whatever not, you know, words that I can't pronounce or whatever. Yep. Super. Anyone else on offer an opinion? One back here. Oh. Um, when we produce clean label, we're saying to the customers that we care more about you and your health than the bank for the buck. Instead of using these chemicals, I mean, everything is a chemical, but these other alternatives that are cheaper, instead we're going to part the money in to invest in the consumer. Great, excellent. So Greg, yeah. take it away. What do you think? What do I think? Uh, well, clean label has to do, in terms of trust, one of the big things about trust is I have to trust someone or something, right? I can't just trust in general. Trust is a key emotion. And we've got a few statistics here on the screen that are, I think, a little bit compelling. So one of the things that we asked people was uh, whether they could identify uh, pieces and parts of their product and their uh, nutrients that were in their food, et cetera, and so forth. Only 43% can I identify an ingredient that they think is associated with a health benefit. So clean label means trust. I can agree, I, I understand, I can read the ingredients. Don't mean I know what they're doing, right? I don't necessarily know what they're doing. 50% uh, of people age 65 or older Right? Believe that unsaturated fats are healthy. Is that good? Is that true or is that false? Anybody? True? No? False? 
There's no hands. Nobody here even knows if they're unhealthy or not. That's good. 78% encounter conflicting information. That's actually surprisingly low to me. I would have thought most people would have encountered uh, conflicting information. Uh, most of our population <laughs> feels like they're on a gluten-free diet right now, right? This is still a really popular trend, uh, but only one in 20 actually are required to do it medically, right? Yet we get all this wonderful information saying, hey, wait a minute, it's uh, maybe gluten's bad for you, but maybe gluten, not having gluten is also bad for you. So 15% higher risk for heart disease from people with gluten-free diets. So should I do it or should I not do it? Is this, who should I trust? What data should I trust? What's good for me, what's bad for me? So who do you think people are trusting? That's a question. Who, who are people trusting right now? Somebody from the audience. Loggers. Loggers. That's right. Social media. And Social so media. Service. Yep. Social media is huge. A lot of other things. I'll show you a few other places that they're trusting. Uh, one of the questions we just asked was, uh, how much trust do you have in the food system that we have today? All of us sitting here are part of the food system. Uh, if you are quick at math, you will notice that only 40% agree that they have trust in the food system. That means the vast majority of our clean label enthusiasts, and actually this is general population, don't trust us. Okay, that's a little frightening. We get quotes like this, right? I think we deserve to know what's in our food. That's back to your comment, right? And uh, my favorite one that kind of hits home, right? Companies try hard to conceal what's in their food. Oh no, now we're evil, right? Now we are evil. Yet at the same time, here's, here's the numbers on sales, right? 2016, this is just specifically for free from foods, foods that are listed as free from on the label, 32 billion. 2021 projected to be up at 441 billion. And if you look at just all natural foods combined together, right, this from uh, mid 2018, $425 billion in clean label sales. Why do you think this is growing if nobody trusts us? Where's the trust coming from? It's gotta be coming from somewhere, all right? So how is trust being built in the food industry? This is now back to you. Social media is one. Anybody else? How else is trust being built in the food industry? All right, off to the side. Claims, like non gmo ah, claims. Claims that we put right. on our labels. I like that one, I like that one. Claims, good claims come. Where else is trust coming from? Nobody else. All right, I'm gonna give it back to Dave. Dave, where is trust coming from in our food industry? Yeah, so if, we started with this question three years ago. And one of the first things we did, and actually Noel Anderson was part of the culprit for getting me involved in this. And he's our uh, president elect, uh, Noel. Uh, we did some social media research and we looked at um, a simple piece of social media, a piece of media. And this was, came from Bloomberg News and it involved a um, small company in Wisconsin that um, where the president had, or the company, they'd been falsifying what was going into their cheese products. And they got caught. And the guy was convicted and gonna spend some time in jail. So, so this came out in the news on February 16th. On February 17th, over 30,000 likes as the major networks, Fox News, USA Today, Business Insider, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera, did this, their own publications on this. And as they went and did their own sort of positioning and talking about this, everybody came up with their own title. And suddenly the whole food industry was putting wood chips in cheese, in Parmesan cheese, okay? 
And then the food babe or other groups of bloggers got involved and suddenly the whole social media was lit up. And this is just in a few days. Now, 30,000 likes, that's almost 10% of the US population. Think about it. So, um, so anyways, this whole gets just to a point to show you how fast information in our, in our society today can spread. Spread information that's true or information that may not be necessarily true. These, this graph shows how Facebook and Twitter has been growing over the, since about 2009. And it's an amazing cycle. So you think about this, and today there's over 2.27 uh, billion active Facebook users and 326 million active Twitter accounts per month. That's a lot of social media. Now, what has this done to the food industry? So think about it. What was some of the most, most amazing uh, sort of change I've seen in my whole career? That's been almost 30 years now, hate to say it, but uh, it was Chobani. Chobani was at the front end of this whole revolution because they started blogging. They were one of the first companies to do blogging and they went within from 2008 when they launched to 2011 to being the number one selling yogurt in the United States, 13% market share. How many find that really amazing? Yeah, I mean, incredible. And it's just because what is being called today the new trust economy is all based on likes. So what else? Food Babe was launched in 2011. She was one of the first bloggers that gone and she is, you know, millions of likes every year. By 2015, we had blacklisted ingredients going into retailers. Okay. Whole Foods, H-E-B, Panera Bread, Kroger, and so on, all got in, in, in creating blacklists into either the whole stores or to various different lines in their stores. 2012, 12, it was only 6% uh, of all food sales were online. Amazon buys Whole Foods and they're projecting 22% of all our food is gonna be bought online this year. That is incredible. We're in the midst of the new trust economy. It's changing our world and it's changing how we need to get, you know, so what do we do about this? So with this said, um, I was at the Expo, well, the West, um, Natural Products West show. Anybody else here? Was there this past year? A bunch of you. 90,000 people attended that. There were 6,500 natural product companies exhibiting their different products. And there were 500, excuse me, 5,000 registered bloggers there's going to be 500 registered bloggers. These people are professional bloggers of various types from macro to micro that are influencing people. They're influencing uh, large numbers of consumers into their perspectives, the brands that they support and so on and so forth. So, so it's having a major impact in the world and how people are shaping their opinions and thoughts about food and food products and ingredients. So how can we, working in the food industry as scientists, deal with this? Okay, questions. That's a question for you. Any thoughts? Just raise your hand. Start blogging like the Chivani blog, okay? Yeah. So, so one follow-up question to the previous slide, though. Those 500 influencers, were they invited to attend, paid to attend, or they're just going to be there anyhow? Remember, these are people being paid to blog, right? This is how they make their money. This is how they make their income for life. So they're there because their potential clients are there. 
right? They're also there because all the news that all their readers want to hear is there, yeah. right? So it's a double value add for them. Yeah, but that you actually can select as you register for that conference if you're an influencer or not. So it's actually one of the categories of employment. Okay, let's move on. That's a good question though. So we're gonna build on this. So, so what we've done in terms of combating this is to think through the food industry needs advocates, but we need advocates from real people. So we've tapped into creating a community right now, several hundred people that we're engaging with every day. So we'd like to tell you a little bit about these individuals that we call clean label enthusiasts. First of all, these people read labels. Okay, that's important to them. And they take action based on not only the claims on the front, but also the ingredient statements on the back. And they have a lot of attitudes. I mean, those attitudes are changing, but they have specific attitudes to labels and ingredients and claims. And that really impacts. So, so we've looked at this. They're distributed uh, throughout. Their, there's a lot of clean label enthusiasts on the West Coast. In the South is one of the fastest growing areas, uh, Florida and New England. Midwest still has one of the smaller numbers of uh, percentage wise, but overall they're 27% of the US population. The distribution of clean label enthusiasts is exactly the same distribution as the rates of increase of natural food products and as well as other types of natural products. So when we asked them about trust, we, we also found that there is a gap. We asked them not only about who do they trust, but also who is responsible for the safety and the products that are, that are out there. And it's really interesting if uh, federal agencies, state regulatory agencies, food companies, farmers, uh, grocery stores, and restaurants all had a gap between trust and who do you hold responsible. Now, compared to other people that are non-clean label enthusiasts, these are all primary shoppers, you see fairly similar patterns, but clean, the gap is much greater for clean label enthusiasts. And you see some interesting things with regard to um, the area of um, nutritional advocacy groups. We also found that clean label enthusiasts are much more trustworthy in, in terms of some claims when it's coming from small brands than large companies and, and large food brands. So this is interesting because if you look at making a claim of a fresh, pure, authentic, natural, if you're coming from, if you're a large company, you've got a trust gap. But if you're saying GMO free or gluten free, things that have a lot more easily verified by various other sort of groups, third party groups or whatever, or, or certifications you can get, people are uh, realize that you're equally trust, trusted because of those certifications. When we ask people why they are interested in clean label, we've got some really, really interesting patterns. We said, number one is just, I'm worried about my health. I distrust food manufacturers. I'm worried about my family's health. I distrust, uh, distrust government regulations are the primary reasons. And some of the comments align with this, you know, companies try too hard, conceal what's in, their, in the food supply uh, for my own um, health, my family's health, safety is really important to them. And there are really uh, a lot of comments about chemicals in food products. And last, food transparency. They want transparency. They want transparency in the labels. They want more information about the ingredients, more information about how the food was made and how it was produced. So these are real people. These are people that we serve. Pe these are people that are seeking to find ways to alleviate their fears. And uh, they are actually really good 
advocates. Okay, they may not be the ones that we would we in the past were so important to us, but they are the future of consumers, and the ones that we really need to listen to, in order that we can take the food industry into the future. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Greg for a bit. All right. Thanks. So, so let's talk about advocates for a little bit, because I think this is a, an interesting area that we can shift our brains a little bit. At, at this point, you think about who are the advocates that, that were the 500 people that were bloggers, right? Those people are being paid to be advocates. It's their job to do that. However, if you look at who people are trusting, you notice that there's a big company, small company gap. Why is that? Because small companies have the opportunity to be completely authentic, right? They have the ability to talk directly to people. Uh, they're clean label enthusiast members, right, who maybe support, you know, insights into what they trust, why they trust what they trust, right? These are people that are just like anybody else. They're not getting paid for their opinion. They just have an opinion and they want to let people know about it and they want to help other people out. They're doing it out of the goodness of their heart rather than out of the goodness of their pocketbook, right? And so we're going to talk about ways that uh, we can build and leverage these advocates to help us understand these insights, to give us guidance into how to build our products better, to validate products before we launch them, right? Because I'd rather validate my product with somebody who's authentic, who's an advocate that's not getting paid, than somebody who's being paid to give me an opinion and may then little be, be more polite to me than they probably should have been. All right. Uh, all right. So first, we got to understand what they believe. If we really want to take advantage of these advocates, we've got to take an understanding of what they believe. So we did a piece of research where we looked at what they trust from this vantage point of news media, headlines about specific ingredients. So we're playing off that idea of hey, is this chemical bad for you or is this chemical good for you, right? Basic idea. So what we did is we built a study where we had ingredients that had, where we wrote a positive statement about it, positive headline about it. We had ingredients that we wrote a negative headline about, right? Same ingredient, sometimes positive, sometimes negative about that ingredient. We made some of them true. We knew were based on science, verifiable, stuff you can find in the Journal of Food Science uh, and nutrition magazines. Some things that we could not find, we verified were false, right? But we're not so outlandish that they were easy to identify. Uh, and then we found, looked at all the different types of sources, WebMD, news media outlets, et cetera, so forth. And we looked at if this headline was in this particular journal, would they believe it, would they not? If it was in this newspaper stated this way, would they believe it, would they not? Where's their trust go, okay? So the first thing that we saw was that if you write a true statement, uh, then you're going to have a much more positive impact than if you write a false statement. So false statements can get a lot of really quick blips, right? Like, hey, everybody has w wood in their cheese, but they're very small blips and they don't make that much difference. Uh, they're very, people are very good at sussing those out quickly. Okay, so true statements are good. The other thing that's interesting is that positive statements are more impactful than negative statements. And that actually is really interesting to me. I thought it would be just the other way around. I thought in this world of crazy politics that we live in, where negativity seems to run the day, I thought, oh man, a big negative statement's gonna get really people going. It didn't happen that way at all. Uh, positive statements actually are more beneficial for you than negative statements. All right, so that was really interesting. Uh, from when it came to sources, so looking at sources that people believe, uh, sources that were like WebMD, Clean Label Project, Consumer Reports, Nutrition, those reports increased the believability uh, that people have in these uh, statements. Okay, things like friends on Facebook, i.e., who knows what their friend is on Facebook, uh, or Food Babe, Food Navigator, Fox News, some of these things that they view as more popular media, if you will, uh, less believable if the same exact headline shows up on those sites. So if you're talking to uh, people about your products, about ingredients, et cetera, so forth, understanding the sources and the context within which you put all your communications is really, really important because you can uh, skew the population. You get more bang for your buck if you go to places where people trust more. 
Hi. It's also helpful if you're trying to refute something, right? Don't source uh, or, or give sources of articles that are less believable or head, uh, you know, news media that's less believable. Uh, if you look at why people believe, so if somebody picked something, and this is an implicit study that we were doing, so this is the f uh, reaction time before a person had to think about it, and then once they, if they uh, reacted positively, we asked them, why'd you react positively? If they reacted fast and negatively, we asked, why'd you ask, react negatively? Uh, when they were positive, when uh, they would say, hey, it aligns with my belief, it didn't seem biased, uh, there were some scientific experts that provided that information, if you looked at why they disbelieved it, one of the things that changed was not provided by scientific experts. Anybody in this audience a scientific expert? Okay. From these advocates' point of view, this audience is the scientific expert. And I think if you don't walk away with anything else from this talk, walk away knowing that you're the people they trust. You're the people that they are looking to to get better information than what they feel is out there right now. And so the question is, where's your information happening? Is it just in conversations with people? Are you actually putting your news out there? Social media is really, really important. Are you engaging with the populations and the people that you're trying to convince and that you're building products for? If you're not engaging that conversation with those people, then you're missing out on one of the most important things that you could do to build a clean label product. 90% uh, 90, 90 of these people are fact checking. 90% of them are fact checking. That means if you're not putting information out there, they can't find it. They're looking for it, they want it. All right, so there's two pieces that I wanna talk about next. And, and that's that we wanna talk about how we guide the design of products. So the first thing you need to do is you need to make sure that you're getting your information out there. The second thing you need to do if you're building a clean product is that you need to help the work with clean label enthusiasts, people that are in your target audience uh, that are gonna advocate for you to help you build your products. You don't wanna go to them at the end after you've built something, you wanna go to them during the beginning when you want to design it. So you want to leverage implicit behavioral reactions. Reactions to products, buying of clean label products, buying of organic, all those types of things, those are very emotionally driven, implicit behaviors that people have. In fact, they are behaviors, most importantly. And so you should be using behavioral measures for them. Okay? And the second piece is you want to collaborate with these folks. You don't want to build something and then force it on them. That's why they don't like big companies because they feel like they don't get the conversation. All right, and when you're talking about clean label products, one of the most important things to people are the ingredients, right? Ingredients are number one, that's half the people. Uh, when people talk, when we ask these advocates, how do you define clean label? They talked about ingredients first and foremost. They talked about it being a food, a product, a natural. They talked about no chemicals, but notice that that's getting down there, 17% mentioned chemicals at all. Uh, artificial was up there quite a bit though, uh, you know, 11%, that was the number one most mentioned ingredient. Uh, what also is really interesting is that if we look at the scores of ingredients, we jump into ingredients specifically and we ask ourselves, are all ingredients made the same? No, the same ingredient in different categories uh, has different meaning to people. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It can be clean in some areas, so for instance, Pantry ingredients are much more likely to be considered uh, a clean label or part of a clean label than any ingredient that is a preservative or is considered a preservative. Seems obvious to us, right? Right. But if you look at something like flavor, right, there's some ingredients on that list that are really clean and some that are not at all clean. All okay. right. If we look at Things like artificial, it makes sense that the word artificial is gonna be avoided, right? Heavy avoidance for the word artificial. So if you look at our clean label score, it's a zero to 100 point score for every single label. Anything down below 25, that's pretty negative. Anything above 75, that's really positive, implicit behavioral reaction to it. Natural flavor, organic flavor, organic certified flavor, non-GMO flavors all get really good scores. If you say both natural and artificial combined, it drops it a long ways, right? Down into 40s, right? 
The other thing that's really interesting is that the uh, same ingredients based on when, when that product is designed to be used could also change. So if this is a breakfast product, a lunch product, a dinner product, uh, notice over here that uh, we're looking at, in this one, this is specific to natural butter flavor. So if natural butter flavor is in a lunch or dinner soup that's designed for comfort, it gets good scores. But if it's in a lunch or dinner's food designed for health, it doesn't get good scores. So how you build your product, how you position your product, that same ingredient on the same label, just based on the marketing and how that product is being positioned is gonna change its uh, belief system or the consumer's belief system as to whether it's a clean label or not, okay? Uh, and then you also well know that you have many ways to label the exact same ingredient, right? Uh, sodium's one of my favorite, salt. Uh, sea salt gets the best. We're not sure why, but sea salt's great. Uh, smoked sea salt, you just call it smoked, all of a sudden it drops quite a bit. Um, salt is kind of right there in the middle, 61. You, you know, you throw any sort of chemical word on there and it drops way, 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 way down, okay? So same ingredient, be careful how you label it. Look for opportunities. You might think that you've got, hey, let's just put salt on there. But you know, hey, what if you call it sea salt? You might have to change a little bit, but could you do it, right? get a better score, it's more believable, right? If you're not working with your consumer advocates who are focused on this, as you're building your product all the way at the beginning, you might design it wrong. You might think not think through all the possibilities of all the ingredients and how you can name them early on in the process, right? Because you'd hate to get to the end and have to reformulate. Uh, also, there might be ingredient options that can help you leapfrog your competition. So we recently did a piece on um, alternative proteins. And we of course have two products that are just taking the market by storm right now, right? In the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat. I, uh, they've gotta be at the show here. I haven't had a chance to walk the floor, but uh, Impossible Burger is soy protein isolate. Beyond Meat is pea protein isolate. They get pretty similar scores. What's interesting to me is those are two very chemical sounding names, right? And notice their scores are not in the 80s, right? So these ingredients are pulling things down. What if they had the chance to change their ingredient profile and were able to label it pea protein instead? Had they known that, would they have gone there? Could they have gone there? I don't know, I haven't talked with them. But see how much of a jump they would have gotten, right? Now, if you're one of these two companies and you're experiencing a lot of competition and you're thinking, maybe I need to reformulate, here's an opportunity. Hi. So collaborating with these folks then is critical. Not only do you need to involve them in the conversation up front, but you also have to collaborate with them on the back end as well. You've got to make sure that as you validate your products in market, that you're talking with these folks to make sure you're not going to alienate somebody if you make a change, uh, that you're going to actually encourage new users of your product if that's what you're going after as well. All right, so moving into the, moving into the final home stretch here. So Dave, what have we learned so far? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> So um, I hope this has been informative, but we're gonna start distilling down some of what we discussed here into some takeaways for you. So um, anyways, so I've got six different, as I said earlier tonight, uh, this, this afternoon, six key takeaways that I think uh, we can all move forward on. Are we okay? We switched. <laughs> okay, I like this mic anyway, better. Uh, so number one, review before you take action. So there's so much good information out there. So many good ways to review. So you gotta think about your targets before you start developing products, before you even start looking at concepts. Think about not only your target consumers, but also your target categories in the eyes of how consumers view them. Because categories may not necessarily be the way they shop in the grocery store. So just like with the Impossible Burger and, uh, you know, and, and, and the uh, Beyond Meat, you know, this category, which is emerging, 
is a really interesting new category. So think about it. So if you're developing a product, you got to look at your competition, look at the ingredients and think about strategically how you can develop products that would be better than either one of these. OK, and if I'm either one of these companies, be really, you look, you know, try to stay in a leadership position by developing your products to make them more clean. Number two, listen to your consumer advocates. Now they may be for an existing brand, they may be your brand fans, okay? But they also may be clean label enthusiasts or other sort of segments that define your brand or define the opportunity in the marketplace behaviorally rather than thinking about it just in terms of people um, and uh, in, their, in their sort of um, uh, how you define them in terms of who they are and, and what they do. So, so that's an important piece. Now, there's a lot of information. As an example, um, one of the, Greg was talking about uh, uh, different types of uh, products like Stevia. We found that Stevia tends to work really well in high protein products and not as well in terms of getting a clean label score from others. So this is, listen to your advocates. If this is your target group, listen to them before you take action. Look at these, this information that's out there in databases. Look at the information you can glean from point of sale data or other ways to really um, take, to, to listen to your advocates. Point number three, co-create with your advocates. By co-creating, I mean, take your research teams, take your innovation teams and co-create with real people that are your advocates. And there's some fantastic techniques to iteratively listen to people and then fast, rapidly look at ways in which you can then take those insights and distill that into actions or new concepts, new ideas to take forward, okay? So this idea of co-creating with your consumer advocates requires your knowledge as scientists, your knowledge of as, in, as, as uh, packaging engineers, or your knowledge as, as uh, product developers, as well as the knowledge of people and what are they seeking, these advocates, in terms of what they're looking for, what are their consumer fears, what are their hopes, you know, and who do they trust? Number four, co-design with your advocates as well as the teams that you tend to work. Now I want to do a shout out to a group of culinary experts. Culinex, raise your hand. This group, they're 100% focused on clean label. They're fantastic culinologists. And uh, they're gonna do a, um, giving some talks uh, this week, and I'm going to have a shout out at the very end of this for a session we're going to be doing tomorrow where Webb Gerard is going to be speaking. But anyways, this is, so work with your chefs, work with your product developers, work with your package engineers to actually do rapid prototyping and do this collaboratively with real people who are your advocates. Number five, Rapidly get products into market. Get them into stores. Do test marketing before you take products and spend a lot of money and spending, uh, you know, uh, getting slotting fees and so on and, and putting things into uh, mass distribution. It's so important to get this sort of feedback if you're going to really understand. So uh, it's very important that if you have brand fans, you have an existing brand, and you try to convince try to create something that's a clean label that you don't alienate your brand fans. So again, listen to your advocates, whether they're your existing brand fans or other consumers that are much more going to take you into the future for your products. Number six, build trust through communication. When you develop products, we have to think about building trust because trust is really at the essence. What is going on with the clean label revolution? If you don't build trust, then you're not going to be successful, okay? And you can do that in a number of ways. 
support it with marketing, okay? Close this gap between who consumers are holding responsible and who do they trust. Build trust, it's really important. And there's different ways. We've learned here, as Greg was showing, reasons for belief. When, when consumers see a new product or they hear something, if they don't believe it, they're gonna fact check it, okay? So understand, you've got to align with consumers' point of view. So if they don't believe in certain scientific facts, it's, you've got to move them very slowly, start with what they believe and evolve their beliefs towards something that will gain their trust, you know, perhaps supporting it through, um, you know, a WebMD and partnering with WebMD or, or different sort of social media things that they trust. So, so communication is really important. And last, you know, be transparent. Put information on, on labels that involves, it tells them not only how the product, what's in the product, but how that product was made, uh, agriculturally where the sourcing was from and so on and so forth. So consumers are seeking trust. Let's find ways to be smarter, create smart labels so that consumers can have and build that trust. So, the opportunity. If you wanna really continue this conversation, learn more, CRAVES, what it stands for, is clean label through rapid agile evolutions into stores. It's a process we're developing in partnership with the Cullinex team. If you wanna learn more about this, if you wanna get a, uh, we'll send you uh, this presentation, um, go ahead and type in uh, text um, C-R-A-E-V-S, to 444-999 and uh, we'll, we'll send you some information and hopefully start a conversation about how to learn more about this. And if you want to uh, further understand more, we've got a session tomorrow. Uh, let's see, it's at 1030 in uh, rooms 390, 392. I'm going to be speaking along with uh, someone from IFF, uh, Roberto Salas, uh, Webb Gerard, who's back there from Colinex, you'll be speaking. And uh, Rachel uh, Chetham uh, will also be uh, 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 finishing up in what should be a very exciting scientific session on the idea of clean label. Greg, anything you want to say? All right. On yet? All right. Okay, so one more time. Um, how many people in here are food industry experts? All right. <laughs> How many people are going to actually get out there and start talking to these people, right? That's what we really need. That's the biggest thing you can do in terms of starting this. We said start a conversation. Why? Because the conversation is where the trust is built. At the end of the day, if you're not having a conversation, then you're not building any trust. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Join us in the conversation, though. Yes. Yeah, so if you're, if you're going to... Uh, sign up. That would be really great. I'd love to talk to more of you. Uh, that's the only way we can learn more is yep. if we collaborate together. We've got 12 more minutes before they'll kick us off this stage. So any questions? There's one back here. Way in the back. Test. Hi. Don't go away. We're going to have some good questions, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going back specifically to the sources clean label advocates believe slide that you talked about. I noticed on there you were kind of making the point that people want to trust like industry experts and scientifically peer reviewed articles and everything like that. Right. I noticed on that um, chart that you had up, though, that Google Scholar was a less trustworthy source to these people. Do you have any insight into why that might be? So. Yeah, I think that what's challenging here is that uh, any of the sites that have uh, strong political bents uh, all get dinged in general. So uh, when you get into things like Google Scholar, if it's viewed as uh, too many articles on one side or the other side of a particular political fence, whether it relates to the food industry or not, they're looking at, you know, these are consumers, they do everything. 
You know, they don't, they don't just think about clean label every day, right? They look at shoes, they look at fashion, they look at everything else. And so when it comes to agriculture and things like that and world politics that relate to sustainability, if there's too many articles on one side or the other, then that will start moving people on or off. Uh, and it's not a matter of whether I agree with them or not. It's just I, fact, I see that they seem to skew, therefore they must be skewed on everything. So it's a not... It's not huge, so the delta you saw there wasn't massive, but it's enough to make you say it's one source, but probably not the uh, only source that you should go with. Any other questions? Ah, right up here. I'm gonna make you run. run? Michael. Thanks. <laughs> Do you think food bloggers have had such a big say in consumer perception because of the lack of scientific voice? in this conversation? Yeah, so the, um, as we, we kicked this thing off of talking about consumer confusion, and, and because of the new trust economy and how much information people are getting, you know, it's, it's open up because no, the, the normal ways of, of believing things are gone because there's too much information, too many sources. You know, people are, are, Facebook was trusted a lot more not too long ago, you know, and, and, and what people are, you know, close to you might be saying, but that's gone. You know, so things are changing. People are getting smarter, I think, <laughs> but the, nonetheless, so, so confusion is really, uh, Beneth has opened the door for uh, a lot of the mistrust that we see. And um, so uh, there's other sort of factors involved. Uh, for instance, we're seeing there's a trend, it's a sociological trend right now, where people are gravitating to smaller groups, groups that are more like you, have your points of view, that you trust these small groups. So, so it's a really interesting trend versus very, so you see it in, in people are distrustful of large institutions like government large food companies, you know, distrustful of those sort of voices and now moving into things that are smaller, smaller groups. It could be online groups. So it may not be so small, but it perceived to think people that you have a somewhat, you know, similar, you know, something that is, um, you know, that you um, can more relate to. Uh, have you guys looked into um, anything that has to do with the number of ingredients on the statement? Um, so if a product has like five ingredients versus 10 ingredients, even though they're both clean label. Yeah. Is there. So Greg. Yeah. yeah. So number of ingredients is is interesting because it's very much confounded with what those ingredients are. So five simple ingredients, that's a good thing because it's quick, it's fast, uh, as long as it's findable on the package, actually. Uh, if it's five ingredients, but you don't know where they are, then that doesn't help you at all either. So there's a lot, of, lot more to it than just simple ingredients. Um, longer ingredient statements uh, actually can be very beneficial for really complex products. So if you're thinking about a meal, that has a lot of components to it, soups that may have very complex, like lots of different ingredients, lots of different uh, products. Those actually can make you believe, oh, there's more good stuff in here, right? If so, if they already think the product should have a lot of good stuff, more stuff could be viewed as more good stuff. So part of it is how the positioning is. Um, you don't want to do things like label every single ingredient as organic, right? You know, organic salt, organics. That won't help you. That'll make it really long and it'll scare them. But uh, I wouldn't say that patently long ingredient statements are bad. Uh, very short ones are definitely good, but there's kind of a gap. Once you get kind of that size, it doesn't matter a whole lot. Um, this kind of goes back to like one of the six things you were talking about, but shelf space can be really competitive so as you try to rapidly test in the market, sort of what suggestions do you have before your retailer just ends up dropping your product because you're testing it, you know? Yeah, that's really good. So um, partnerships in this industry are essential to success. I think the um, retailers, do you work for a retailer? 
No, okay. okay. So, but retailers, they want to make money like everybody. They want to serve their customers that go to their stores. They want to differentiate their stores, you know, better than anybody. So, um, so partnerships we're finding are essential to getting slotting spots for research purposes. And uh, so not all retailers are going to view that, but there are some that are much more innovative than others. And so I think that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to look at. So, yeah. so um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think that's the, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a question of which retailers are you going to partner with? Right. And, and because you're never going to be able to get all products tested all the time, uh, the fact that 22% of sales are moving online uh, allows you to say, well, I can get at least a finger in the wind, uh, or even more so if you know that product is actually destined for a lot of online sales. So by doing some online mock store trial work, and that can be done very efficiently. There's a lot of good companies that provide that work. Right. Any other questions? Oh, right over here. Test. Thanks. Do you think any of these uh, clean label research and insights apply to the actual ingredient manufacturers or the ingredients themselves? Um, see, I have not seen any evidence at all for that. Uh, what you'll do see, for instance, saying non-GMO this, non-GMO that, we're finding is less important than saying non-GMO on the front is a claim. So, uh, but, but in terms of, of course, some ingredient suppliers may be the only one to be able to brand and put something in a label. So the first one to bring out Stadia, right, did very well. And so, so that's where the differentiation is. I'm not too sure how many consumers know who that company, that ingredient company was? Probably not. Uh, but, it, but this brings up a really good point is when you are bringing out a new ingredient, awareness or um, so, you know, so is really important. Uh, familiarity, I should say, is really important because we have found that uh, work we just recently have done on looking at alternative proteins is the, the proteins that did worse were the ones that were less familiar or ones that showed like for instance, pea protein or pea protein isolate or isolate from pea protein have very different sort of reactions. Um, spirulina or spirulina or, or things like, um, you know, of course you could say, well, insect protein, you expect people to say, oh, that's awful, right? Uh, and that does get hammered. But uh, so so the so the point is, if you're going to create a new ingredient, and get it on the marketplace, you need to market that to the general public so that they will accept it, become more familiar with it or perhaps name it in some way that makes it less scary and something that has inherent meaning. So it's, I think it's a really important question for those that are in the ingredient manufacturing as part of our business. Yeah, that was a really great question. Good question. Any others? We got time for maybe one more question if anybody has. Oh, back here. So, this question is going to be related to claims. So, sometimes we start producing clean, clean products, okay? Yet you're doing this at a gradual pace. So, the minute you put that something's clean within a brand portfolio where things aren't clean, What's the perception of that from the consumer standpoint? So from the large company standpoint, that's why there's a trust gap. One of the reasons that we heard there's a trust gap of the large companies is because they have a brand that has ingredient, you know, products within that same branded line that are clean and aren't clean. And so they say, well, if they can do both, why didn't they do everything for me? So now I don't, not really sure if I trust all the products in their line. Are they just faking it for this one product or what they do differently that they couldn't have done to everything else? Cause they don't understand 
the chemistry. They don't understand sourcing. They don't understand all those other things, you know, ingredients, which ones you can and can't partner with. Right. So because of that, there's they start second guessing as to whether that brand really has that going on or not. The second thing that compounds that is that that brand usually isn't talking to people. There's no 21 year old straight out of college sitting there blogging or on Twitter saying, hey, this works. This is great. We're making a difference at this company. We're changing things. That authentic conversation isn't happening. So unless that starts happening, we're done. (laughs) And thank you, everyone, for your time. That was very subtle. All right.